My heart sank as I boarded Queen Mary 2 in Southampton for my first trip in around eight years, a transatlantic crossing. I spotted areas on the hull looking battered and rusty, and I wondered was this the evidence that recent critics were right and Queen Mary 2 was becoming run down and her glory days were done. I'm Gary Bembridge. Join me as I look at how this famous ship stacks up today. There is no doubt this almost 20-year-old ship has signs on the hull of being battered by the brutal North Atlantic crossings it does 20 to 25 times a year. While most regular cruise ships spend five or six days a week in port, allowing the crew to constantly touch up and keep the hull and hard-to-reach exteriors looking sharp, this is not so easy on Queen Mary 2. This liner spends almost all her time at sea, often in port just one day a week for eight hours. It's really challenging to keep much of the hull and those hard to reach external areas pristine. While that is understandable, I wondered about the interiors and the open decks of the ship that many had also criticized. The interiors today were much as I remember them, a nod to the glory days of transatlantic crossings with an art deco look and feel. Little of the look has changed, though the carpets are a bit jazzier and it does look a bit dated, but it has always looked a bit dated. It's a deliberate design harking back to past liner eras. There have been some updates like solo cabins have been added, the elevator has been removed from the grand lobby, and the rather soulless winter garden lounge has been turned into the much more comfortable, much more appealing Corinthia lounge. However, despite hunting, I found very few examples of the ship itself looking shabby. I saw crew during the crossing constantly out on deck painting and touching up areas that they could actually access. They were also frequently in the hallways, crew fixing issues, doing general maintenance activities and so on. However, there were a couple of areas that did seem to be being ignored. For example, the Deck 12 Pavilion Pool, which is the indoor pool, looked really run down and unloved, with one noticeably damaged area on the roof seemingly being left to decay. I visited a friend in their Deck 5 shelter balcony and there were rusty water stains along the pipes right along that deck, which was rather unsightly and also odd that it had been left like that. However, in terms of the overall maintenance and condition of the ship, I certainly didn't see what many people have criticized. I wonder if some focus on the decor looking dated versus modern crisp cruise ship decor trends is what people are focusing on, but it's not actually in poor condition at all. One area that does feel dated to me though, by the way, is the bathrooms. They are old fashioned with some completely anachronistic features like an ashtray next to the toilet. I personally don't think travelers should worry much about the ship being run down, but I do think there are other things about the ship today that may be issues for some. Over the years, I've spent 11 weeks on the ship and on this trip, I still found it baffling to find my way around. Why? Well, Queen Mary II was designed as a liner to cross the Atlantic in the most stable and comfortable possible way. It does not follow the usual layout of regular cruise ships. On regular cruise ships, the main dining rooms are usually at the very back of the ship and the theater at the very front. And in between, in the middle of the ship, are the bars, lounges, casino, guest services, shops, those kind of things. The main pool and the buffet are at the top deck with most cabins between there and the decks with those restaurants, theater, and those other venues. This is not the case on Queen Mary 2. The designer pushed the big public venues as low down in the ship as he could. Many are within the hull and at the waterline and much more midship, so they're in more stable areas and less prone to movement. The Britannia restaurant, for example, which is where most people dine, is closer to the middle and right down on decks two and three. The Queen's room, the massive ballroom used for dance classes, afternoon tea and evening balls is low down on the ship too on deck three. The theater is also located much more midship and low down than on regular cruise ships. Behind the theater, toward the front of the ship is Illuminations. This is where they hold lectures 
during the day. It doesn't have to be as stable when it's sailing, like the theatre has to be for the dancers and entertainers to perform, so the theatre's brought more midship. Unlike regular cruise ships, there are huge numbers of cabin low down and within the hull on decks 4, 5 and 6, including cabins with sheltered balconies cut into the hull itself. Even the open deck pools are on lower decks than on regular cruise ships. To achieve this means a slightly confusing layout, especially to regular cruise ship travellers, because it doesn't follow the usual rules, and getting from one menu to another is less obvious, often requiring a diversion along lengthy passageways around large venues. For example, to get to the Queen's Room, you have to go along a corridor around the Britannia restaurant. To get to Illuminations, to go to the lectures, you have to find and then go along a corridor that goes around the Royal Court Theatre. Despite all that, there are some unique and magical places on this ship. The Queen's Room, where the balls, live orchestra, afternoon tea and dancing classes is magnificent, enormous and breathtaking. The tiered Britannia restaurant with sweeping staircase and huge tapestry is a grand spectacle of a dining room. Illuminations, which hosts the only planetarium at sea, is a dramatic venue for talks and those shows. There is a vast library which has over 10,000 books. Up on the 12th deck, there are kennels which can hold up to 24 cats and dogs on the crossings. There's the teak full wraparound promenade deck, which hundreds walk every day on the crossing. Go around it three times and you've done 1.1 mile. Because of its slightly strange layout, there are places and features that many miss out on because they just don't know they exist or how to find them. There are, for example, two scenic lifts between deck 7 and deck 11 that tucked away at the front of the ship they're hard to find and impossible to see from out on deck, so most people don't know they're there. On deck 11, there's an open observation deck overlooking the bow of the ship. It's a really great place to go when sailing in or out of New York to see the Statue of Liberty. There's a Commodore Club and Churchill's Cigar Lounge, which many forget and miss because it's tucked away right in the front of deck 9. They're also hidden in what I guess are called Easter eggs, and maritime nods that, again, many people miss out on. For example, there's a small Homer Simpson buried in one of the Art Deco style panels just outside the Golden Lion pub. G32, the nightclub, is the name of the hull of the ship when it was being built in the shipyard. Sir Samuels, which has a partnership with Godiva Chocolates, is named after the founder of Cunard. The Corinthia Lounge is named after the very first Cunard ship to ever do a world voyage in 1933. There is also then a magnificent maritime history walk dotted around the ship which tells the history of Cunard and celebrities that have cruised on Cunard over the years. But all is not perfect with Queen Mary II and there are some areas that show it is out of touch with contemporary cruising and has definitely some growing weaknesses as cruising evolves and passengers' needs keep changing, certainly in the two decades since it's launched. First, Queen Mary II is a bit stuck in the past. It doesn't embrace that travellers are now connected and tech savvy. I met more passengers who follow and watch my YouTube channel on my crossing than I have ever done on any other cruise that I've ever been on but the ship is just not tech savvy enough for those people. They updated the Wi-Fi, which is poor. You can't stream with the so-called streaming package, and it's almost impossible in many cabins to get a Wi-Fi signal. There's no proper app. There's a half-hearted attempt at an app that is clumsy and it's really hard to use, so most people don't bother. The television's not very interactive either and you still have to go down to the purses deck to solve many queries, make many bookings, which means there are always lines there. Little things like there are no USB plugs in the cabin, or even plugs next to the beds to charge your devices, which is frustrating. Another issue, which I think is a big one, is I think they're slipping behind with their grills experience. In their grills, they have Queen's Grill, the biggest sweets of all who eat in the Queen's Grill restaurant, 
and they have princess grill which are the smaller sweets and they eat in the princess grills restaurant. Cunard focuses the grills experience very much on the dining experience and undoubtedly the queen's and princess grill dining experiences are probably the best dining experiences I've ever had anywhere at sea. However, other lines have upped their sweet experience beyond what Cunard are doing. Some have created ships within ships like MSC Cruises Yacht Club and Norwegian Haven with access controlled areas with lounges, bars, pools, hot tubs, decks, concierge service and restaurants for their sweet guests. Celebrity, for example, have also created what they call the retreat for suites with an expansive, really plush lounge, a large deck with a pool, a bar, a snack bar, as well as having a dedicated restaurant. On Queen Mary 2, there's a small, unimpressive grills lounge, not the sort of place you're going to want to hang out in very much. There's a concierge lounge, which is inside on deck nine with no windows, a little bit dark and gloomy. There's also a deck which is more of a thoroughfare in reality and has one small hot tub on deck 11. All of these are dotted around the ship and in not one key space. The overall grills experience and perks while good is not as good as the sweet experiences on many more contemporary lines that I've been on over the last few years. Another really weak area is fitness. The gym looks very unloved. It doesn't seem to have been updated and is pretty much ignored by the people who run the spa. There are also almost no fitness classes and no studio to hold them in. There's a few yoga, stretch and meditation classes offered, but with really limited numbers and they were held up on the pavilion pool deck. Fitness is an important trend for modern travelers. Cunard are not keeping up. They don't offer much specialty dining on Queen Mary 2 either. There is the Veranda Steakhouse, which is okay. It's not a particularly great venue. And there also are some themed paid for evenings in the King's Court Buffet. But again, it's not a particularly great venue or that inspiring. They haven't really focused on specialty dining, which seems important to modern travelers too. However, saying all that, Queen Mary 2 is unique. Much of its eccentricity is part of its magic. The thing I love about Queen Mary 2 is it is different to any other ship that I've ever been on. It's weird, it's strange, it's confusing, it's baffling, but it is a magnificent experience and a wonderful ship. If you want to know more about crossing the Atlantic like I've just done on Queen Mary 2, look at this video where I face the three biggest fears that people have when they go on a transatlantic. See you over there.